Hello and welcome to the Eastern Front. My name is Delbo Rohash and I'm a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm joined by my friends. Giselle Donnelly, I'm also at AEI and... Julia Zorza with the Middle East Institute, Georgetown and George Washington Universities. On our podcast, we talk about the many challenges to European peace and security that have erupted along a line running from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, the Eastern Front, and about why those matter to the United States. Our special guest today is Marek Dieter, the CEO of Warsaw Stock Exchange and an economic advisor to the President of Poland. If you enjoy this episode, please consider subscribing, rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. Marek, it's great to have you on the podcast and obviously there are many topics connected to Poland that, that we will try to cover, but perhaps it might be best to start from the general and go to the specific and perhaps take a longer perspective on, on, on current affairs. So one of my favorite perhaps most striking statistics about Poland's economic takeoff uh, relates to the fact that back in 1990, Poland's real per capita GDP was roughly at par with Ukraine's. And over the 20 plus years that followed, Poland became almost three times as wealthy in real per capita terms than Ukraine. And at the same time, and you can speak to that, uh, Poland has become a real hub for, for the region's capital markets in a part of the world that has been traditionally dominated by bank-related finance. So, so I wonder if you could maybe walk us quickly through what you see as the main reasons for for Poland's economic takeoff, its centrality as, a, as an economic hub, and perhaps reflect also on whether you see Poland's success as being perhaps under threat by, you know, say the war, by Europe being a slow growth region, and by the ongoing, you know, global economic fragmentation. First of all, thank you very much for having me on the show. And if I understand the task correctly, I should summarize 30 years in three minutes, more or less. That's basically right, yeah. Starting back to 1990, there was a contraction of GDP of 12%. There was 17% inflation, but per month, uh, not per year. Uh, and then employment was rapidly increasing. And also Poland or last Polish communist government defaulted on the Polish debt because we should also uh, remember that back then we were starting uh, with a huge debt burden, mainly in, in dollars and uh, Deutsche Mark and French francs, and then Poland defaulted on that. And fast forward, uh, we are now in terms of purchasing power parity richer than, let's say, Portuguese, and we are very close to Italian. So basically, we made a tremendous progress from a bankrupted, uh, defaulted country, the country with uh, huge structural problems, huge unemployment, huge uh, hyperinflation to the stage where we have a uh, uh, stable market uh, economy. And part of uh, this success was also capital market and uh, exchange, which I run. Looking back, first exchange in Warsaw was created in 1817 and it was the major exchange for Kingdom of Poland, but the, for the whole Romanov Empire. It was performing very well. Uh, roughly 3-4% of the global trading volumes by the 1900 was uh, in Warsaw. Today we are still uh, way, way smaller in the global comparison, but we are by far the market leader in the region. Just to give you an idea, our trading volumes are twice as big as the Austrian stock, Vienna Stock Exchange, four times bigger than Athens Stock Exchange, eight times bigger than Budapest or Prague Stock Exchanges. So uh, you see that it was, uh, compared to our peers, it was a tremendous uh, success. And basically both Polish uh, economic miracle and growth of the, or development of the exchange were related to the entrepreneurial spirit. Simply Poles were allowed from to travel abroad, even to the West from the 70s, what was the unique feature in the communist bloc. And the people were working 99% illegally <laughs> um, in the West, but they were uh, um, uh, bringing some French francs, Deutsche Marks, uh, or some dollars from the US. And this was the economists call it primary accumulation of capital. So compared to, to our uh, peers uh, in other uh, countries, Poles had some savings and also they had some experience with the market economy and this uh, resulted in uh, creation a peak time 3.5 million enterprises in poland currently we have 
one million active firms, uh, close to three, three millions are registered, but million are really active, one million is really active. So for a population of 38 million is quite okay. The second reason behind the growth of the Polish economy and the um, exchange was quite a quick opening for the capital flows from abroad and mainly from the West. And there was a unique period of time in the early 90s when uh, Poland and other transition economies were in the spotlight of the global investment community. And uh, we were quite successful in uh, getting some key investors into our country, which resulted in a kind of a positive spillover. So first were these early innovators, those first uh, companies which uh, invested in Poland, but the uh, others followed the suit. And when you look at FDI statistics, Poland was always performing very well, both in per, per capita basis and also in absolute numbers. And the f- third thing was major institutional reforms and especially uh, late uh, 1990s and early 2000s and especially year 2001 was at the beginning of the uh, real fight against the corruption. So basically back in 2001 the, the corruption scandal was disclosed and then there was a parliamentary commission which actually looked at very deep links between a politician, business people and some even Polskay mafia I would say. And this was simply put in the spotlight and this was very refreshing for Poland and the, the fight with corruption became to be really serious. And then the 2004-2005, when we joined the European Union, there was another booster for, for combating corruption and also institutional reforms. And after that, we are 3.7 times richer than we were back in 1990 and way were richer than uh, were, for example, Ukrainians before, even before the war. So this is a pretty good job in an overview in a few minutes over over 30 years. But would you zoom us a little bit into the current environment? We're now over one and a half years into the war. We've seen Europe unprecedentedly decoupling itself in terms of energy. Not perfect, but still unprecedented. And that and the war itself have taken a toll on the um, economies. Dadebur was earlier mentioning kind of a question of whether the EU is slowing, has been slowing down Poland in its economy or not. And overall, I guess my question would be, where is the Polish economy now? One and a half years into the war, in a a specific political and economic challenging context at a regional level, as well as a continental level, and with elections coming up, and with EU funding withheld, where do you see um, the Polish economy currently, and where, what should we be expecting in the months to come? Is it a stable um, enterprise, or is there? do you expect shakings at times through the next few months? Very good question. Let me start with energy thing, uh, because there were two waves of uh, somehow as you call it, decoupling from Russian gas in Poland. In 2006, the LNG infrastructure was, uh, construction of LNG infrastructure was initiated. And since then, the the whole infrastructure was completed a few years later, but uh, we have an access to LNG for all around the world. And the second uh, wave was in back in 2016, when we started to construct Baltic pipes, so a direct connection between Norwegian gas fields and Poland via Denmark. So basically, we're ready to decouple from Russia completely when it comes to uh, liquid gas um, in uh, 2020. So actually, for, for us, cutting off the supplies from Russia was relatively easy. And we also possess relative high deposits of coal, what is environmentally not friendly, but still secure 70% of our uh, electric energy production. But we were importing crude oil and some coal from Russia, and we were very successful uh, in um, finding other sources of coal for import to supplement our domestic production. Even we have too much coal now imported to Poland and the prices were dragged down by that. 
and we also sold uh, one of minority stake of our raffinery in northern Poland to Saudi Aramco. So we were very quick to change to the Saudi uh, crude oil. And also technologically, we're ready to accept both type of uh, crude. What is important as some of uh, like Hungary is or Slovakia are struggling because the refining capacity is not ready for the crude other than the Russian one, the Ural type. So we have successfully decoupled from Russia. Second, we were, since 2014 or 15, Poland was accepting record number of Ukrainians coming to Poland, mainly for economic reasons. So we uh, issue a first Schengen type, so EU type permits, residency run permits were number one in Europe from 2015. There was like 600 800,000 of these permits issued every year. So uh, we built up quite a decent community of Ukrainians living in Poland. So it was not a surprise uh, when the war started that many Ukrainians were simply coming to us because they have some relatives in Poland and also they knew Poland. And the, the only difference was that those the second wave of immigration from Ukraine, they were rather Russian-speaking Ukrainians, and Russian is more distant to Polish language-wise than Ukrainian to Polish. But all in all, we were able to accommodate a relatively high influx of war refugees. And also there was a, a notice move from Polish National Bank, which agreed just after the war started for Ukrainians to convert Hrivna into Polish Zloty. To my knowledge, it was the only central bank in the world which was still accepting Hrivna. Of course, there was a cap on that, how much you can exchange, but out of sudden, those Ukrainian refugees from this Russian-speaking part came here, but they were still able to use their own currency, and it boosted enormously consumption in Poland. If you have three or four million people coming, you give them favorable exchange rate to get their money out of the bank, they are also eager to consume. That's, that's obvious. So uh, it was a huge booster for our GDP. Even there are some statistics showing that Poles were very conscious about the consumption. So all the growth last year in the consumption was resulting from the Ukrainian refugees. At the same time, also Kashenko regime in Belarus became much harder. It's hard to estimate, but roughly 300,000 Belarusians came to Poland. We have now what we can say for sure that we have 120,000 Belarusian paying social insurance in Poland. So if you count up with the families and so on, you come to close to the 300,000. And we have uh, roughly, in the peak, we had uh, 900,000 Ukrainian children pupils in our schools. There are 4.5 million primary school and high school students in Poland pupils. So we top up with 20% extra kids. And currently, we know it very precisely because there is a special uh, subsidy from the central government to local governments to finance Ukrainian kids, and the recent number was 250,000 kids we have. So all in all, we have more or less half a million Ukrainians now uh, permanently living in Poland, maybe somewhat uh, more. In peak time, eight, 800,000 Ukrainians were paying social security in Poland. So they were, are they employed or they started their own business? So we see that um, our recent economic development, our economy is almost flat. The growth is around 1%. It's mainly to the, it's a result of the very high base last year where consumption was growing double digit and the GDP growth was uh, six, 7% in the peak quarters. Uh, so we have a flat growth. There were also uh, increasing interest rates and we have roughly 90% of mortgages on the, on the floating rates. So there's transmission is very efficient from the interest rates into the cooling down of the economy. So we have now flat growth, let's say 1% growth what is flat. We have around 3% unemployment rate uh, according to the EU method of measurement, according to the local method is around 5%. And uh, so, so very tight labor market, flat growth and inflation of 8.2% on the yearly basis. So we see that uh, the situation is stabilizing. The inflation went down from 18.5% to 8% and uh, will continue to go down. We have base interest rates of 6% now and we have third month in the row PMI is increasing. So looking forward, it looks 
promising. But we have to take into account that Poland, since the war started, spent roughly 3.8% of GDP on the aid for Ukraine without private aid. So we can count up to over 4%. And we also will spend this year roughly 3.8-3.9% of our GDP on defense and security. So we see that we are a kind of a country which is like on the war condition because you, you don't usually spend on war-related things like Ukraine and security 8% of your GDP effectively. And if it's going to continue, it will be a challenge for our public finance. The estimated budget deficit for next year is 4.5%, so it's still reasonable. But we have to take into account that in this 4.5% uh, sits aid for the Ukraine and Ukrainians and also enormous spending on security. Well, you have to learn how to spend like an American. <laughs> um, I do want to make one more pass across the corruption issue. I mean, you're quite right that it was a huge success story um, in the mid-teens. And, and of course, so much of this is, is really hard to measure with precision because the metrics are all sort of surveys and perceptions and so on and so forth. But but Poland was really at the top, you know, as good as any Western European country when it came to the perception of corruption. And over the last four or five years, that seems to be slipping down or, or slipping up, depending on, you know, what's the right way to, to look at it. Is there an explanation that you see for that? Or or do you think that the reality is out of sync with, with the surveys? I was looking quite deep into the surveys and I figured out one pattern which is somehow related to our juridical reform in 2018. It's a little bit complicated matter, but in a nutshell, there was a provision or there is a provision you can go to the court and complain about the past decision so revoke the past decision if you go to the highest court in Poland and this was especially striking for our FDI investors so both who are building greenfield factories and those who are investing into our previously state-owned companies and there was a risk that current Polish government which is not privatization friendly will start to complain about this privatization processes and some decision about you know tax exemptions for the foreign investors and so on and so on and indeed the foreign investors started to complain about uh, one thing corruption but they were I think mixing those two things that actually they were really afraid that it will be a withdrawal from the past privatization and and decision to grant some permits and so on. The other thing is on the local government level, indeed there is a currently a challenge uh, resulted from relative empowerment of the local government when it comes to local investments. Um, in the past, there was a local governments were mainly financed by the, their share in the personal income tax. But the current government decreased dramatically personal income taxes, especially for large families. Effectively, those who have four children or more do not pay taxes at all. And the tax revenues for the local governments were actually uh, heavily depressed. And to compensate that, the central government gave a subsidies. But those subsidies can be spent only for investment, not for the running costs. So the local government started to invest quite heavily in the recent three years. And it seems also from hard statistics, not only from the different surveys, questionnaires and so on, that there were more and more corruption cases on the local government's level. And the third thing is that we should not be neglected that current government put a lot of money into anti-corruption police, which was created in 2006. And there are plenty of cases disclosed by this police, ranging, some of them were actually cases from 2012 or 14 or so on. And you can have a feeling or you can see that this anti-corruption police called CBA is it's constantly showing new cases but those cases can range from uh, up to 10 years so you have a news flow about 
corruption on the civil government level and on the central level from various years. Mainly those cases are related to VAT, so value-added tax evasion, which is a landmark of this current government. So Poland was most efficient in Europe in closing this VAT gap. And one of the measures was going after the corrupted tax officials. So I have a, I have a twofold question, which in a way comes back to to my initial one. So so the first part of the question has to do with the net effect of the war and of, sort of geopolitical instability on on Poland, because clearly uh, it is a mixed bag. I mean, you have to spend more on defense, you have to spend more on public services for the refugee population, but at the same time you have become a sort of natural attractor for especially the most sort of productive and entrepreneurial people from Belarus and, and, and in Ukraine at the time when, you know, your own demographic outlook doesn't look particularly optimistic. That is a good thing. And actually in terms of integrating people and into the labor market and putting them into sort of productive uses, Poland is doing a, you know, very good job, partly because of the sort of culture proximity. So, and, and also think there is a role to be played by Polish businesses going forward in, in, in Ukraine's reconstruction, which might not be negligible. So, so I wonder, you know, what your assessment of the sort of net effect of the war on, on, on Poland is going to be. And more importantly, and more broadly, wonder what you see as the path forward for the Polish economy. So you described the sort of drivers of Poland's success in the past. Quantitatively, the most significant of those, I imagine, is the inflow of foreign direct investment following 2004 and, and so on. And, and, but you have to wonder to what extent that model has sort of exhausted itself by now. And, and, and you know, where these sort of high value added business models are going to come from without they can con- going to come from within Poland or what, you know, what the plan is. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that then finance minister Mateusz Morawiecki was presenting his his big investment plan to basically avoid the so-called middle income trap for Poland. I mean, I wonder, you know, what the latest is on, on, on this sort of thinking within Poland and and it's, you know, bringing the, the Polish economy to the to the next level. Very broad question. Let me start with kind of a peculiar feature of the Polish economy that over the last 30 years, compared to our peers, Hungary, Czechia, Slovakia, whatever, investment intensity was relatively low in Poland. So we were investing proportionally as a share of GDP, however you want to measure the intensity of investment. So we were uh, investing less, but actually Poland was growing faster. So Mr. Solov must be surprised by this development. And uh, I did my research on that and I figured out that compared to our peers, we were indeed investing less. But when you would divide the industries into high value added and low value added, actually in this high value added industries, we were investing more proportionally than Slovakia, Czechia and Hungary. So actually it is a strange thing, but Polish investments were actually directed better to more value adding creative activities compared to our peer. If you can continue that forever, you don't know because you, it could have been matter of like that you uh, simply uh, put your money into the right direction, but it can also result from the better efficiency of the financial market, both banks, risk management by banks, so they were giving credit into the right direction, and also efficiency of capital market, venture capital, and so on and so on. We don't know, but it can be one hypothesis to be tested here. Yeah? The second thing is about this future model, and this future model should relate more on R&D investment or R&D related investment. And the recent eight years, it's a dramatic growth. So share of R&D investment to GDP increased in Poland two times or even more. It was 0.7% of GDP and now it's 1.8%. So it's a massive growth over recent, less than a decade. And hopefully we again invest in the right value creating activities, but we'll see it later. When it comes to the balance of the war and growth of Polish economy, obviously Poland cannot be neglected when it comes to logistics, current related to military, future related to the reconstruction of Ukraine, there are social ties, there are hopefully Ukrainians who would like to come back to Ukraine and uh, they had good memories from working in Poland, so they might be natural ambassadors for the Polish companies investing in Ukraine. But we have to be also conscious 
is that our stock of capital com on per capita basis compared to, let's say, Germans is like 1 to 14. Yeah? And you cannot avoid this di disparity. Simply two worlds which were resulted in a huge destruction of the assets on the Polish soil, especially Second World War. 40% of our assets and cultural heritage were destroyed in the Second World War. Then the communism and so on and so on. It was, it's very hard to catch up. So Poland had to look for niches. So Polish companies has to look for niches and both in terms of their long-term growth and in Ukraine also, reconstruction of Ukraine, because on the cost of capital side, we cannot compete with Germans, French, US and so on. But we can find profitable niches uh, in Ukraine. The second thing related to the Polish economy was that since we joined the European Union back in 2004, our agriculture export increased four times in real terms. Yeah? Uh, so we become really agriculture power hub of Europe. But after building a free trade zone and then Ukraine joining European Union, there would be a huge competition from uh, Ukrainian farmers. 70% of the highest fertility soil of the world is located in Ukraine. So it's very hard to compete with this large scale of agriculture and with this quality of soil and so on and so on. So th this could be a major challenge and we have flavor of that currently with this uh, grain crisis and so on, it's just the beginning of uh, really severe competition between Polish farmers and Ukrainian farmers. So again, only via technological progress you can compensate the constraints of the natural conditions. Yeah? And uh, last remark, Poland is mainly growing in the industries like video gaming. We as a stock exchange, we are hosting on our venue over 70 companies, close to 80 companies from this industry. We are number one in terms of number of game developers in the world ahead of Tokyo and Seoul. And we see these creative industries are uh, expanding very nicely. IT sectors with the support of talents from Ukraine and Belarus. So long term, I'm very positive on the Polish economy and on our prospect uh, on this Polish-Ukrainian cooperation. But short term, as you mentioned correctly, it, it, there are several social challenges, especially for female. And people ask me why. There's this nationalistic party, which is also performing quite well in recent polls. And we, we are two weeks ahead, ahead of the election and they get between 10 and 15 percent. And why the female females are considering voting for them, despite the fact that their candidates are around 2 percent are only women and so on. And one reason for that is that short term disappointment related to longer queues to, to doctors and kids doctor cool kids uh, which who do not speak polish so you have to adjust the your teaching approach uh, in the school competition on the labor market because we have a lot of female immigration from Ukraine and so on. So short term, you have discontent of women, you have discontent of farmers and so on. But long term, I'm really positive on Polish economy and on growth and on Polish role in the reconstruction of uh, Ukraine. And the last not, but not least, what we can export to Ukraine is uh, institutional framework. So we were successful with combating co corruption. We were successful in closing the VAT gap and so on. Tax revenues are increasing faster than the uh, GDP growth and so on. And this can be very helpful for Ukraine. But it's also like with our exchange, we signed an MOU with the Ukrainian Secrets Exchange Commission and EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, to build Ukrainian capital market. But we also recently signed a uh, relatively large agreement with a completely private Ukrainian energy exchange, our subsidiary sign, and we will be doing clearing for this commodity exchange. Uh, so we see that even under the war condition, we are ready to invest. We are ready to help set up modern uh, capitalists in Ukraine. And like uh, I remember it's quite well from the early 90s when my grandfather was a senator and he was a professor of economics and he was welcoming different experts coming from various countries and they were helping out shaping our capitalism. We can again do the same for Ukraine and help. We have first-hand experience in transition of the economy from so-so market economy and the Ukrainian capitalist was in many aspects corrupted. Um, not only by corruption, but very corrupted. And we can uh, find a solution together with our Ukrainian friends for boosting uh, the institutional framework of Ukraine. I think this is very encouraging to hear because there 
have been concerned, especially in recent weeks, about you know Poland's relationship with Ukraine. I mean, you know, the grain crisis. There was you know back and forth between President Zelensky and and various Polish officials during the UN General Assembly week. And and you know some people might be sort of concerned about a sort of you know possible souring of especially the Polish public sentiment towards Ukraine. I mean, you know, there is there is a certain Ukraine fatigue setting in in the United States, and if Poland somehow weakened its resolve to to help Ukraine defeat the Russians, I think that would be really bad news. But from what you say, we are not really concerned about that risk. And you know, whoever comes out of the of the elections as as the new leading political force. You know, this is a non-economic question, obviously. You, you are not concerned about, you know, the prospect of Poland, you know, becoming less of a supporter of the Ukrainian cause. I want to add to that because, Marek, at some point you were describing um, specifically the grain issue as just the beginning in terms of competition that you um, highlighted between Poland and Ukraine, where Ukraine, of course, has, compared to all countries in the region, an advantage. And so we see a, a politically extremely fragile state right now in which Poland is leader and has the capacity to shift support in one way or another. We just had election outcomes in Slovakia and we have in and we saw what happened um, over the weekend with aid in, in the United States. And so my question is also to add to that in the coming months, we're supposed to have negotiations starting for Ukraine joining the European Union on a fast track or not fast track, etc. And, and Poland plays a specifically important role in that, in that it can really shift the balance and support or not support. So do you see this, um, what you're describing as just the beginning in terms of strategic agricultural competition as endangering the regional and support from specifically from Poland for Ukraine in their accession to the European Union? Let me start a very brief historic remark that over 550 years ago, the first parliamentary session of Poland was held and people who were allowed to vote in Poland were between different historians give different numbers between 7 and 11 percent of people were allowed to vote and every two years there was parliamentary session and there was later commonwealth of poland obviously lithuanian ukrainian so relatively big country the polish lithuanian commonwealth is one of our favorite topics on this program <laughs> Exactly. So you know better than me. And there was, if you look at the transcripts from this period, there were always discussion to what extent you should send the troops to defend East flank against the Ottoman Empire or Russians. And those in the West, today's center of Poland, were uh, not that eager to pay taxes to defend because they were safe. At this time, there was no war with Germans or something. Uh, so there was no risk from Germany and so on. And that, that's the one remark. So there were always, we have the similar discussion we had over the last 550 years to some extent. And the second thing, if you look at the richest people in this Commonwealth, Polish, Lithuanian, whatever, Commonwealth, Ukrainian, and of course, concept of nationality is very new, but you can see by the religion. And if you look at the, by the religion, the richest were act, actually Greek Catholics or Orthodox. So it shows you very precisely the richest people in the Commonwealth were actually in Ukraine because they, they were Orthodox people, basically. So there was always this East-West competition, but we still could live 500 years peacefully together. So I think there will be... On the one hand, of course, uh, competition and pressure on the EU to re reform the common agriculture policy. And the major obstacle is actually France, not Poland. <laughs> and we have to find a solution. And the major, and aid for Ukraine, uh, I see more risk on your side of the Atlantic. So basically, that's the thing. And also with the Slovakia, at least briefing I received today in the morning from as advisor for the president, we received brief briefings. And this briefing shows that it's not certain that FICO will form anti-Ukrainian government. So it might be too early for Mr. Orban to, you know, uh, to say that there is another country alive. 
So I think that the case is not lost 100%. The, the, the situation is very complex in Slovakia and the role of president. And so there is a complexity level. So I think in a natural Poland, in a strategic issues like we were defending Ukraine from Russia and from, from Ottoman Empire for 500 years, we're going to continue to help Ukraine to combat Russia and secure peace in Ukraine and integrity of Ukraine. In, and the strategic issue won't be heard and... 80 to 85 percent or to 90 percent of votes will be given for the parties who are pro-Ukrainian in Poland. So do not expect Slovakia case when the major party is against. But there is also some economic interest which uh, might not be on par like it was 500 years ago, 400 years ago. So it's nothing new. I think the more pressing issue is the question of the political situation in Ukraine. Because maybe you you have more insight, but from what I've heard, if the election were held today, it's not necessary that President Zelensky would secure the majority in parliament. Most probably he would need a coalition government. And we don't know who's going to be in this coalition. And one important factor and one of the factors which were used also by Russia in the past is Ukrainian nationalists. And history from 1940s and uh, ethnic cleansing by Ukrainians of the, of the Polish population in today's Ukraine is still hurting a lot. And exactly there were two, let's say, one uprising and one ethnic cleansing done by Germans with uh, cooperation of Ukrainian nationalists. And they were used in the past by the Soviet propaganda in showing Poland that we were ruling this Ukraine and we are using the political power of our poor Ukrainian society. In reality, the Ukrainian elite polonized in the way that they started to speak Polish, but there were uh, actually social tensions, one Ukrainians against the other Ukrainians, and then the language was the, the limiting factor. So I would ask more what's going to happen next year if there's going to be election in Ukraine and which parties going to be represented there and what attitude to European Union, to Poland, will be there. On a strategic level, I'm quite confident that as long as we have the current president, there will be support from Poland. And also, I expect the next parliament, which will be voted in two two weeks, will be also pro-Ukrainian. I I would like to sort of uh, send us out with uh, a question about that combines both uh, politics and economics and strategy. Uh, you mentioned in passing earlier the amount of money that Poland is spending on uh, enhancing its military power. It's been really quite extraordinary. I haven't actually run the numbers, but I would not be surprised if it surpasses in purchasing power, certainly, the size of any German Zeitenwende, uh, you know, and seems more tangible than than the Zeitenwende. But there's still, if you will, a niche market for a rebuilt European defense industrial base, especially one that's better linked to both the U.S. defense industrial base, but also the sort of global Western defense industrial base. I notice in this regard that Poland is buying Korean tanks, for example. So my question is both, do you think the buildup is sustainable from a fiscal point of view? And second, if there's any discussion about trying to organize a a genuine transatlantic defense industry that's effective in a way that, say, Franco-German industry has has not been that that industry has atrophied and will be very difficult to to get it back and to structure it to produce the weapons that the alliance uh, requires it seems to me that there's in addition to the national uh and alliance buildup that that poland has already invested in there's a real opportunity to again just try to organize something that will sustain what is required, clearly, because the Russian danger is not likely to be over anytime soon, that would feature a strong role for for Poland. Well, in this respect, I'm referring to this pan-European or transatlantic effort to build a defense industry. I'm not that optimistic, unfortunately. Poland is indeed spending a lot and we simply bought what was on the stock because we gave our armor to Ukrainians, effectively. 
So that's why we refer to South Korea, also to US, because US was quick to deliver us Abrams and so on. We have to catch up very quickly because effectively we gave all our post-Soviet binary to Ukraine. Uh, we also offered our whole production capacity to Ukraine. People ask why we were not bidding for some armor tenders in Romania. Simply, we don't have more capacity. Everything is used for Ukraine. And that's, that's the very simple answer. But having been traveling extensively to Brussels on various occasions, I don't see among the EU elites, I do not feel that they sense the threat from the Russia. Real. And they are also bound by their local politics, they electorate, they do not fear Russia. So telling people that we spend less on pension but more on the defense industry might not be a winning strategy when you are a democratically elected politician. I, I'm saying we should do without those people. So, and this is a huge difference. I was traveling last couple of months, three or four times to Bucharest where you have completely different mood than in Brussels. <laughs> uh, so in Bucharest, they are perfectly aware, like in Poland, that you have to build up your defense capacities. And in Brussels, they say it would be nice, but my feeling is that we would love to outsource our defense to US and preferably US should spend on this defense and we will keep on spending on our healthcare, welfare states and so on. That would be the optimal solution. So I even wrote a paper it's not a very long one, but it, somehow it resonates. And on, based on Israel, South Korea and Taiwan showing that actually if you move to more defense-oriented or security-oriented economy, you do not have to compromise on your economic growth effectively. Only you have to spend the money wise. <laughs> That's the prerequisite, obviously. So I was giving the example of NATO Innovation Fund, which is targeting dual-use things. You can build up your industrial base also with dual-use. In the communist Poland, there was a lot of factories which were producing too many units of construction machinery and so on. Just to keep the capacity, if you have to switch to tanks, it's very easy. So you also can have this kind of dual-use factories which can aid both your growth and so on. People say a lot about near shoring, but actually two thirds of the industrial and manufacturing jobs in European Union are created in Poland. So the rest of Europe is not really reshoring, reindustrialization in Europe is not progressing nicely. And so you can get both, but you cannot get at the same time uh, your uh, all your ambitious environmental goals. So I think the Western European elites are a little bit kidnapped I can say more about Germans because I watch German TV as a kid. I lived in Germany and in Austria, so I'm somehow part of this culture as well. So I think the politicians are bound by their promises of the welfare state and uh, energy transformation. And there is really no resources and political will left for the uh, defense. And this could be a major issue dividing East and West. Baltic states, which are also spending even proportionally more than Poland on defense of their small countries, Romania, Poland, and so on, the, even Greece. <laughs> we are perfectly aware what can happen about the threat from the East. And our Western counterparts do not see it the same way. And this, this can be a major issue when discussing enlargement of the EU, internal EU policy and so on and so on. So stay tuned because there they can be a major difference between 14 countries in the West and 13 countries in the East, which realize that something can go wrong with uh, Russia if we do not spend enough on uh, security and defense. Marek, thank you so much. Nothing like an economist to remind us of the importance of trade-offs in public policy. And I think it's something that is being forgotten on this side of the Atlantic as well. That's my job. <laughs> yes, he has no place in American politics whatsoever. <laughs> you know, you are spoiled by printing dollars and that. You are not aware that much of this. You know, you have to wonder to what extent the exorbitant privilege is also a curse of sorts, that it dulls down our ability to actually make trade-offs and make fiscal decisions. But that would be a subject for another episode, maybe for another podcast. <laughs> From, from me, Dalibor Rohaj, and... Me, Giselle Donnelly, and... Julia Zoza. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Front, a podcast dedicated to security challenges that have erupted along the line running from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. 
You can find more episodes and additional content on our website, AEI.org, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please do get in touch with us on Twitter using the hashtag EasternFrontPod, written as one word. And don't forget to sign up for the Eastern Front's newsletter through the link included in the show notes to receive more content from the Eastern Front. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. Thank you, and goodbye.